Well, welcome to episode 17 of Thought Leader Life. We're here with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Thanks. I'm Michael Procopio. And I'm Mitchell Levy. Great to be here. So for our first question, um, we'd like to ask, what is your definition of a thought leader? Well, I think a thought leader really is someone who's done something extraordinary, someone who has stepped out and created a different way of doing something. A thought leader is not a title that someone gives themselves, but it's something that the people who are following the leader actually give to that person. And it's a result of something that works. It's a result of doing a, a process, a business process, or a way of thinking that's different than what already exists and something that has been successful. Uh, in order to be a leader, you really have to show success and you have to have followers. So it's the followers that give someone the title of being a thought leader. I, I, the only thing I can add to that is that uh, the thought leader uh, really uh, gives his followers permission to uh, go down a new road. And the permission comes in a lot of different ways. It's not just the rah rah, you know, you can do it stuff. It's really this has been proven to work financially. Uh, we made a profit doing it this way, or we reduced our overhead, or we reduced turnover, or we uh, increased engagement, or uh, we we in increased customer loyalty. So these are all attributes. Uh, that people seek to have, and a thought leader is someone who actually helps them achieve these goals, uh, albeit in a new way. You know, you guys, you guys are so cool, both very articulate answers, and I think if you don't mind, would you introduce yourselves uh, to the audience, because it, it's, um, when you say who you are, people are going to go, wow, that's these guys, holy cow. So why do you introduce yourself from the where you were and sort of kind of where you're going? Well, I'm Bonnie Harvey, and I'm co-founder of Barefoot Sellers. We started it, Michael and I, together in 1986, and we had it for 20 years. Uh, we sold it in 2005, and during that time, we um, brought it to one of the fastest growing wine brands in the nation. And what's unique about that is that we started without any funds and we started without any knowledge of the industry and we were able to grow it and make it become very popular. It was in all 50 states. It was in 28 foreign countries and all the military bases and was one of the fastest growing wine brands in the nation without paid advertising. And uh, that has gained us a lot of recognition, and we're very happy to be sharing that message now in The Barefoot Spirit, which is a book we've written that was a New York Times bestseller. And we're also speaking at universities about entrepreneurship and talking to students that are studying courses in entrepreneurship. So that's what we're doing today, and that's where we came from. And I'm Michael, and I'm Michael Houlihan. And... Uh, I, you know, I can get a word in edgewise here once in a while, uh, but, but the idea is that, uh, you know, I, Bonnie and I work together, um, and we have different skill sets. Uh, I'm more on the sales and uh, marketing end of things, and she's more on the financial, legal, organizational side of things, and believe me, you need to have both of those heads working together um, in order to be a success. So I'm, I'm very uh, blessed to have a partner like that uh, all these years. Uh, Barefoot uh, was revolutionary. It was the first brand of wine that actually made wine fun. Uh, wine was very serious business in the 1980s and even into the 90s. Uh, there was no fun labels. Uh, everything was, you know, pretty much in French. Uh, and uh, it was browbeating and uh, patronizing approach. Uh, we got into the wine business and we said, you know, it, it's, it's, it's too bad that people have this attitude toward wine because wine should be fun. So we put a foot on the label. We had a slogan, get barefoot and have a great time. Uh, and the approach was more of a beer approach in terms of marketing. 
And uh, what we found out uh, right away... It was a beer approach without the, super, the $2 million Super Bowl commercial. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and certainly without the Chuggala contests. But uh, we, 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 we worked together, Bonnie and I, and we built this uh, giant brand, uh, and we were fortunate to be able to sell it to... Uh, a, a big company that is a closely held uh, family-owned company that has taken our DNA and, uh, and actually stepped on it and made it even better than it was when we gave it to them. So we're very happy with the acquisition. You know, 85% of all acquisitions fail in the first two years. So we're very happy that our baby is still alive and kicking, so to speak. Uh, by the way, it's very cool. And, and, I, and, and by the way, I also still use you nice, nicely notice the term you used. They took our DNA and stepped on it, you know, like stepping on grapes to make wine. I like that. Um, but I, how many companies, how many founders have created a vision and produced a product, and then the 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 acquirers actually take it to the next level? That's fantastic. Yeah, we're very. We were very fortunate. Very fortunate. So you used, if I'm thinking about this. In listening to you, you guys kind of used what I call lean thought leadership to get your brand out there and get your messaging out there. Uh, you made it fun, but you did it in a very, very proactive, very systematic way. What are some of the things you did? Well, Bonnie, do you want to start? In the first place, in the um, mid-80s and early 90s, there really wasn't any fun labels out there. So by putting a foot on the label, right away people were having fun with the bottle even before they popped the cork. So that was innovative. We found that the majority of uh, wine buyers in California were female shoppers at the chain stores. And they wanted something that had consistent flavor and something they could rely on. They picked it up like a staple. So another thing that we did that was innovative is we had a non-vintage product. That means that there was no year of uh, harvest on the label. So we could use a variety of different vintages um, to put in our products so we could attain the highest quality taste that was a consistent flavor by using mixed vintages. So that was something else that we did that was unusual. Um, we also had very colorful, fun point of sale material, always going for the fun. We think that wine really should be fun. A lot of people have fun drinking it, and it seemed to be more the gatekeepers that were um, men um, at the time. There's a few more gatekeepers now that are women, um, but at the time it was difficult. The men were looking for something that. Uh, had a different flavor each year, therefore buying more of the vintage type wines. So we had to get the female shopper into the stores looking for the product. And the way we did that that was innovative was by going out to the communities and, and meeting people face to face in community fundraisers and nonprofits and uh, understanding what it was that our customer wanted in the communities um, besides just a good bottle of wine. So we were supporting the community fundraisers and the nonprofits that our consumer was interested in. And those were a couple things that were very innovative. Michael? So, so by the way, Michael and Bonnie, what's really interesting, A, you're, you're, you were obviously looking at the numbers, you were looking at the analytics, you were giving them, you know, sticking with your theme, sticking with your guns, which was, which was really the, the fun component, Yes. Um, and then, and I love this aspect, you were actually getting in front of your future advocates and turning them into advocates. Absolutely. I think that uh, the one thing that, uh, that Barefoot did that was remarkable is uh, that it built a big national brand. It was in all 50 states and uh, 28 foreign countries and all the military bases uh, and most of the chain stores and did it without advertising. That, that's amazing. That, how that do you is get impressive. The word out? How do you get the word out? And so, yes, we created advocates because we gave them a social reason to buy our product. Not, not a mercantile reason, but a social reason. And today that's become a lot more popular with transparency mm -hmm. and, you know, the Internet and, and everything that's going on in social. Uh, and, and, and we couldn't be more pleased that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, the world is coming around to uh, the common sense, which is, we're voting with our money, 
You know, we can buy any product we want to. Why do we buy this product over that product? Is it just because of the features and benefits, or is it because we like the way this company is doing business? We like the way they're treating their people. We like the way they're treating the environment. Uh, we, we like the way they're treating us. And so uh, one of the things that, you know, I know you're going to talk later about transition, but one of the things that we did at Barefoot was we applied a set of standards to our business that we are now teaching. And those, those standards we call the guiding principles for success. Well, well that's, I mean, I really like that. So the transition for you, when, when did you actually uh, write the, the book and, and become a New York Times bestseller? And then what are you guys doing today? Let's talk about that. Well, it was a few years after we'd sold uh, the brand, Barefoot Sellers. A lot of our employees were coming up to us and saying, you really have to write a book. Um, they'd gotten more experience out in the world with more jobs and they realized how unique our system was of paying people and how we treated people and basically what Michael had said before our guiding principles for success and they felt that it was important that we share these things with other uh, business owners and uh, entrepreneurs and so that convinced us to write the book it took about two and a half years to write the book now, Michael and I didn't do the writing. We told the story to Rick Cushman, who was an award-winning journalist and also the wine writer for the Sacramento Bee for a number of years. So he knew about wine, and he had a great sense of humor. So if you're going to write about barefoot and put a foot on the label, you better have a good sense of humor. So in telling uh -huh. the story, it's a business adventure story. It's not prescriptive text. We told him the story. He came to visit us and stayed uh, for a couple nights every two weeks, and we tell him the stories and had a hundred dinners and over a hundred bottles of wine, and uh, wrote the book. And hey, I want to I sign up for that one. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> and he did an excellent job of making all the stories a lot of fun, and they're not just a lot of fun, but they're also educational. So they don't spell out in, in lessons, but they do show the challenges that we had and how we adjusted to them and how we responded to them. And it made for a very fun book, which is why we, were, we became a New York Times uh, bestseller with The Barefoot Spirit. The full title is The Barefoot Spirit, How Hardship, Hustle, and Heart Built the Nation's Number One Wine Brand. Hardship, hustle, and heart. And actually, I, I would say that's probably what you're teaching entrepreneurs. Hardship, hustle, and heart. Because yes. people are always looking for that easy answer, you know, and there, there are no easy answers. It's just by probably following the principles. Let's talk about that. Right. So hardship is uh, obviously not having enough money or maybe not being knowledgeable enough about your chosen profession or, you know, the, the, the industry that you're going into. Uh, and certainly not having the experience or, or understanding the nuances of that industry. And so you're basically, you know, going to get your butt kicked. I'm sorry. Uh, and so the question is, you know, do you learn from that? And uh, so that's hardship, okay? Hustle. Now everybody says follow your passion, follow your passion. Okay, well, that's great. If you're lucky enough to do that, God bless you. But most of us have to follow our opportunity. So we think that opportunity is really where hustle comes in. We had an opportunity. We had an opportunity to convert a debt into an asset by making a trade for goods and services for a client we had who wasn't getting paid by a major winery that had just uh, filed a Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So we took, instead of money, we took wine and bottling services, which was great, except that now we had to sell it. But you see, that's where the hustle comes in. Then the other thing is heart. Heart is how do you feel about it? It's, it's more about when you go with your hat in your hand to somebody and you say, listen, I don't know what I'm doing. I need help here. That's humility. That comes from the heart. When you put yourself in the other guy's shoes and you say, what kind of a wine brand would I buy? What, what, uh, how much money would I spend for it? Uh, that's, that's empathy. That's heart. When you pay your salespeople on a commission basis and you don't put a cap on the commission and you're not the slightest bit jealous that they're making twice as much as you are and you own the company, that's hard. 
So that's why hardship, hustle, and heart equals success. Well, also nice. heart, heart also, of course, is working with the community and showing an interest in supporting the same things that they're interested in. Uh, these, these are great lessons, but, but let me see if I got this right. You're saying that serendipity allowed you to get in this business because instead of getting paid money, you got paid with the services that then became this company. Yes. That, yeah, that's right. We fell into the wine industry backwards. We yeah. never had an intention of going into the wine industry. Yeah, it wasn't it wasn't our passion. No, as wasn't. a matter of fact, uh, we we didn't even like wine. We were intimidated by it at the time. You know, uh, people used to see us. Uh, you know, maybe having a beer, and they'd say, "Well, you're in the wine business. Why are you drinking beer?" And we'd say, "Well, it takes a lot of beer to make good wine." <laughs> that's too funny. All right, so serendipity. Certainly, certainly <laughs> I like it. So, so serendipity got you to 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 do the wine, write the book, and now you guys are traveling across the country talking about entrepreneurship. Absolutely. Yes, we see students out there that are graduating with with big uh, student loans, and they're unable to get jobs, and it just breaks our heart. And we know that if you can encourage people to start their own businesses, then they really have an opportunity of being their own bosses, of discovering something that their community needs, and and supporting this kind of idea. So we go out there and we support them by sharing some of our guiding principles with them. And we've been to about 20 universities in the past year and talked to students of entrepreneurship, and we've gotten a very good response. So we're going to continue doing it. It's uh, very rewarding for us. Uh, we've now spoken to over uh, 10,000 students who are studying entrepreneurship. And it's interesting because entrepreneurship wasn't even a valid field of study uh, 10 years ago, except for certain pioneers like uh, Babson College that have been doing it since 1979. Uh, but most of the universities kind of got into this by default, and it was, you know, as I like to say, default of de fact that there was no jobs. And so, you know, here they are graduating uh, business students, and uh, during the recession, the first thing the corporations did was eliminate a lot of the middle management jobs, and those were the entry-level jobs that these business grads used to go right into. And so they're not there anymore. So what are these kids going to do? Uh, we think that maybe they should give some thought to self-employment as a valid form of employment. And in order to do that, uh, they need to know certain principles. Now, the schools that teach entrepreneurship are doing a good job of teaching form and function, which is you know how you write a business plan, how you get a loan, how you do a budget, how you hire and fire people without going to jail, all that kind of obvious stuff. Okay, so that's form and function. What they need help in doing and what we're talking about is sales and navigation. Mm -hmm. And sales skills is really about putting yourself in the other guy's shoes. It's about the liberal arts. It's about understanding history and culture and religion so that you can bond with people. It's communication, see? And then actual and actual guidance, actual actual navigation is how you make decisions, what your strategy is. What is your end game? Why are you doing this business in the first place? You know, are you doing it because you can't get a job, so you're giving up an eight to five for a five to eight? Or are you doing it because you want to create a legacy? You think your kid's going to take care of you when you get old and gray? Good luck with that. Or are you really building a brand equity? Are you adding value to something that you will eventually sell? And that's how you will monetize. If you're in number three, and that's where most of the young people are today, which is serial entrepreneurship, build a brand, sell it, build another brand, sell it. If that's what you're doing, we can help you. Nice. Well, you know, What's really fascinating when I'm looking at the world today and I'm looking at the, the biggest trend is, is social selling and having salespeople within their workforce be mini micro marketers. Uh, mm -hmm. By definition, you know, your focus on entrepreneurship and the things that you're saying and what's relevant for these guys are also relevant for every company who has a sales force today, right? Because you got to be social sellers, you got to be micro marketers, you got to do, you have to have heart and do the types of things you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would even go further and say, you know, we call it seven sales. You have to make seven sales. The first sale that you have to make is to your own people. 
Because if you want social selling, your own people have to buy into not just what you're selling from the mercantile aspects of features and benefits, but also how what you're selling is making the world a better place and how, how they're being treated in their working environment. That's what's going to get them excited about staying with you and sharing what they know about your company with their family and friends and social networks. And so it starts at the top. Nice, nice. Well, I like that. So you said seven things. I'm actually interested. I the first one I like because you need to make every employee an advocate. So I I like it. I'm I'm with you on that. Give me give, give me a couple couple more. That's the first sale is to your own staff. The second sale is to the distributor, the ownership of the distributor. The distributor buys maybe because he needs a product like yours or he doesn't want his competitor to get your product. Um, the, the distributor sales manager would be the third sale and he buys because he wants to make his numbers. He wants to make uh. a certain number of sales. So how do you help him achieve that? is the question. Always put yourself in the other guy's shoes again, find out what he wants and give it to him. Um, so, the Bobby, let's, let's stop, before you get to four, let's stop there for a second because what I could tell you, how many, how many entrepreneurs and actually how many businesses actually sell the distributor and then just assume that the distributor's manager is going to be on board, right? How many don't, how many do two and not three and subsequently, they wonder why their business is not going anywhere. Well, yes, I agree with you. I was going to say it's as many as who fail. If you want to be a success in business, it's less about your product, which has to be terrific, by the way. It has to be reasonably priced, and it has to be endorsed by everybody from Tiger Woods to you name it. So what? It still sits there in the barn. If you don't start making those sales down the distribution channel, you go out of business right away with a perfectly good product. Mm -hmm. So the warehouses of America are filled with great products that can improve our lives and even extend them. And they're rotting there. Why? Because the owners of the business focused on the end user and they said, well, look at this. The general public will like this. This is something the general public will buy. And they were correct. What they forgot was that they can't get it to the general public. They hadn't thought about all the people that they had to go through to get it to the general public and what each one of those people wanted and putting yourself in the other guy's shoes to give them what they wanted. Ah, I love it. Okay, got it. So, okay, so that's three. Making sure well, the district four. manager is behind you. Yeah. So no, that was number four, right? Okay. So the next guy that you got to sell, of course, is the uh, sales manager, salesperson. Now the sales manager salesperson is a salesperson who works for a distributor that has a warehouse that has a lot of products like yours and he runs around and he goes and makes calls on retailers that buy products that are like yours from that particular warehouse or distributor or job or whatever you want to call it. Now that guy, he buys for a different reason. He's trying to make his Porsche payment, right? He's trying to keep his girlfriend happy. This is a guy who has a need for cash and so his concern is what's the commission on this product? Are there any spiffs on this product? And even better, how are you going to help me sell this? Do you have a representative in the territory who's going to actually run around and make sales for me and help me make this product success? Okay? So then the next person you have to sell is his customer, which is the retail buyer. Mm. The retail buyer, he buys for a whole different reason. He's interested in the best use of his shelf space. He wants to know that you have a product that has proven itself in other retailers, that you have a representative that will get rid of spoils and take care of problems. He wants to know that you have point of sale materials and advertising materials that can be used in his store that will help him sell that product. He wants to know about the price that the product is to him and whether or not it's on special and what kind of programming is involved. And then you have to sell his clerk because the clerk is the guy who's where the rubber meets the road. This is the person that actually talks to the end user downstream buyer, the general public customer. He's talk they're talking to the clerk in the store. So if the clerk in the store is sold on the product, they're more likely to want to introduce those people to your product. Why does he do that? You took him out to lunch. You made him feel important. You knew all the ball scores. You understood his team. 
Give not, him a t-shirt. You gave him a t-shirt. You know, you gave him a product. Uh, yeah, you, you turn him into an advocate. You turn him into an advocate, right? And you, you, you send him a postcard, you know, not an email and uh, not a tweet. You send him an actual postcard. And then, if you're lucky, you get to sell the seventh sale, and that's the general public. And like you said earlier, Mitch, so many people that are entrepreneurs or create products, they think that they're selling the general public. Well, you are ultimately. But how is it that you get the general public to come into the store and buy your product? Well, you can do it through advertising. You can do it through social media. But we chose to do it through a type of social media that existed long before the computer, and that's nonprofit organizations because they are already a hub. They are already made up of people who are qualified buyers because they can go to a $200 a plate fundraiser, so they're qualified. And so a man and a woman will go to that fundraiser, they will see our product, whether it's being served or whether it's being auctioned off to raise money for their event. Uh, they'll see the list of where to buy it. They'll know that we support them because they'll see that we're taking their message and putting them on tags on our products in the retail market, a, a market and a, and a venue that they could never gain access to any other way. So they see us as advocates for them. So then they become advocates for us. They want us to succeed. They want to tell their friends and family about our products. So they are the apostles that go out and, and spread the word at that point. You know, I, I will, um, it, it, you know, we're, we're closer to the end. Michael, you're going to have to wrap up for us pretty soon, Mr. Procopio. Um, but, you know, this is one of those shows. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'm going to be sitting back thinking to myself, Wow, when I run into people who want to learn about social selling, when I run into entrepreneurs, I'm actually going to send them here. And of course, all the other follow up stuff that you guys are doing are fantastic. But I, you know, it's a, a short amount of time, but a real condensed version thinking about the things that are just not taught in school today. And, and this was fantastic. Thank you. That's why we're so excited about talking to the university students. And, and also, anybody who wants to get more information, we write a couple of no-nonsense 600-word blog posts each week at uh, thebarefootspirit.com and uh, thebrandauthority.net. And uh, we try really hard not to use any four-syllable words. Uh, we just break it down in street English. Uh, it's easy to understand. Uh, we write for an audience of young people uh, who are really fed up with uh, rhetoric. So we use a lot of uh, examples and stories in our writing. And I think that it, uh, people will find it to be of great advantage if they're going into business. Mm -hmm. Well, excellent. So that was the barefootspirit.com and the brandauthority.net? Yes, and they both begin with T-H-E. Okay. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to thank our sponsor, Think Aha. Um, Think Aha turns experts into thought leaders, and the latest offering that they have is a replica of the show, so thought leadership interviews, where you can bring your customers or your guests and interview them and uh, improve their thought leadership along with improving your thought leadership. In addition to that, they uh, think Aha is the publisher of 42 Rules series, of which I'm published with 42 Rules for B2B social media marketing. And then there's the Think Aha series, which comes in two forms, both uh, a paper book form as well as the Think Aha app. And the Think Aha app is a great way of taking your advocates and, uh, and helping them advocate for you because the app is made up of 140 uh, Twitter-sized quotes, and it makes it extremely easy to share those quotes. So with that, uh, Michael and Bonnie, let me just ask you, was there anything that we didn't ask you or any points that should have come across that we didn't hit on yet? Well, one of the things about um, being a thought leader, as uh, the universities have come to, to call us, is we really encourage people who are starting businesses to start small. And I think that's really important uh, for anyone, particularly students as they're just starting off and, and 
leaving college and, and joining the workforce. Start small and really understand your business and distribution management. Understand all seven sales, whatever it might be in your industry. And um, grow your product in a slow way so you're able to handle all the various challenges that you'll get as you start a business. It's more important to be very successful in a small area than it is to try to spread yourself out and uh, not be able to handle all the problems that you're going to encounter as you start off in a large area. Just be small and very successful in your small territory to start with. And you're going to make mistakes and that's why as Bonnie says uh, you know, make those mistakes in a small area because you can't run all around the country with your hat in your hand apologizing to everybody. So get your act together before you take your show on the road. And when you do make mistakes, have an attitude about it. Just say, okay, I learned something today and figure out what it is. We say make mistakes right and we don't mean R-I-G-H-T, we mean W-R-I-T-E, which is write, write them down and here's what you do. You get a new clause in a contract, you get a new label, uh, you get a new uh, sticky note, you write something down. Maybe it's a policy, a procedure, it's a checklist. These are all documents. All of those documents need to be updated every time you make a mistake. When we started our business, our contracts were only three pages long. When we sold our business, they were 37 pages long. That's how many mistakes we made. Amazing. <laughs> hey, that was great uh, advice. That, by the way, that's the uh, we we got to do a book called "Make Mistakes Right." Um, I, I love that. <laughs> Let's do it. Or hey. never waste a perfectly good mistake. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love it. you guys are fantastic. I I have to tell you what what bothers me a lot today is somebody graduates from from college or B school, and then and 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 if they actually do go to a company, they then need three to six months training before they become effective. Right, and we should be training the skill sets you guys are talking about. We should ex be exposing people to experimentation now and learning from your mistakes and and actually going out of you and and how to actually sell. I mean, we're a sales taught in school and love what you guys are doing. Looking forward to the new crop of people and we'll help you however we can. And just to tie it all together, what you're doing at the university level also applies to corporations who have to figure out what social selling is all about. And so there's a there's a long path for you guys with lots of opportunity here, and I'm excited about it. Good. We're looking forward to working together with you. All right. Well, we will see you next week on Thought Leader Life. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us. Thanks Thank a lot, you. Mitch. Let's stay in touch.